Josh Randall. I'm one of the co-creators of Blackout. Blackout, to me, quite simply, is an immersive horror experience that contains many different meanings and definitions to many people, but I think it really, truly encapsulate everything that Blackout is and what it speaks for. Blackout is an immersive horror experience. The team of Blackout is actually myself and my creative partner, Chris Thor. We created it together. Chris is one of my best friends. He and I have been uh, work partners and good friends uh, for many, many, many years, way before Blackout started. Uh, we've had several different producing partners over the years that have come on and come off, but creatively, Chris and I have always been the core creative team, making all the creative decisions and doing all the directing and writing. This year, in particular, for our return, for our 10th year anniversary, uh, we're bringing on Eric Vossmeyer, who's a uh, producer as well, um, and helping us put this together. So the primary team for our 10th year anniversary is Eric, Chris, and I. In terms of speaking to coming back every single year and reinventing the show and constantly asking ourselves as creators new questions, at the end of the day, it's relatively simple. We're trying to create something that we think is effective and something that is intense and unforgettable. And I think with every single year, Chris and I are obviously always in different situations and dealing with different things. And so within that life context, we're always looking at it from a different perspective. We'd never sought out to specifically undermine the haunted house. We just wanted to create an experience that was scary. And to us, traditional haunted houses weren't that scary. And so, it wasn't so much trying to upset the genre in any way as much as it was just actively trying to create something that was scary. And so for us, that is what we continue to do every single time. We try to ask ourselves what is effective, uh, what is scary to other people, and I've said this before, but fear is subjective. And I think fear is a very, very hard thing to pin down. And in a weird way, we almost let go of trying to be scary, whatever that means, because it truly does mean so many different things to so many different people. So for us, it's just about creating an effective experience. In 2009, Midsummer Nightmare is basically where it all started. Uh, it initially was an idea that Chris and I had to create a scary experience in the middle of the summer. Obviously, it was something that we had never really heard of or had been to before. And uh, I operated and managed a theater on the west side of Manhattan at the time, so I had a venue at my disposal. So it was relatively easy for us to just shut down for four weeks and come up with some crazy ideas that we thought would scare the shit out of people and move forward with it, and we did. And very quickly, the idea uh, obviously really caught on and, and there was a very genuine, palpable response that we could sense from audience members coming out of the show, uh, but also from just a marketing and a, a producer's sort of perspective, uh, we, we sold the show out. There were lines around the block of people looking to get in. Uh, so it just was a signal of, I think, everything that was, that, that was about to happen within this immersive horror world and this sort of door that somehow we kind of unknowingly cracked open. So when 2009's Midsummer Nightmare started, I think we almost, a little tongue in cheek, almost jokingly veered very much within the horror genre. So the first Midsummer Nightmare was almost traditional. When you look at the, the, the new blackouts and, and the more contemporary blackout and where it went, the traditional Midsummer Nightmare was gory, it was violent, uh, there was a lot of very blatant uh, sex uh, uh, references and um, a little bit more boo scary. That was sort of the impetus for, for walking into the horror genre. I think for Chris and I though, it's important to state that from the very beginning we've always been doing 
immersive shows before that was kind of a buzzword in any way, shape, or form. The first show that Chris and I did together was on a boat um, in the middle of, of the Hudson River in the winter. And the audience, uh, we picked them up from a street corner and drove them in a car and they had an audio experience and then they were wrapped in these blankets in the bottom of the boat while they watched this show uh, called The Blind, which was actually written in the, the late 1800s by Morris Maeterlinck. And then immediately following the show, there was a massive dinner that was served to the entire audience and the cast in the hull of the ship. So, I, I mean, even from the very beginning of our collaborations together, immersive, was always a really important part of it. So even though A Midsummer Nightmare skewed towards the horror genre, I think Chris and I do a have a very strong focus on the atmosphere and the environment. And for me, within the world of immersive, I respond significantly more to uh, experiences and, and sensory experiences than I do to narrative. For me, story does not come first. Um, story will always follow no matter what happens, whether I want it to or not as an audience member. So um, as a creator, it has been more important to focus on creating a strong atmosphere and environment for the audience to then project their own narrative on, on top of. That's always been a theme, I think, in my work and very specifically the work that Chris and I have done together and Blackout was no exception in that so even though it was violent even though it was um, bloody and there was a, a giant dildo prop and um, there was a man with snakes coming out of his butt and uh, like it was just it was a little gory and silly but it was very much about experience and it was very much about atmosphere and environment and I think that has always been a strong through line in our work and I hope, I hope that it continues to be because that is the work that I, I respond strongest to as an audience member. At no point in time did Chris and I ever assume that this was going to become what it eventually became. Uh, in, in 2004 is when I actually took over the theater, the Sanford Meisner Theater and the Vortex Theater Company, which is a non-for-profit in New York City, and I had a company. And, and for six years, I very actively, as a producing artistic director and a managing director of a theater, very actively tried to create a theater company. I had a theater company and worked with amazing people, including Chris, including several other amazing writers and directors and with shows that I'm intensely proud of. None of which really had the effect that Blackout had, which is obviously from a, a sort of capitalist standpoint why it continued. That said, from 2004 to 2010, we actively were trying to create a theater company. And, you know, we did. <laughs> Blackout is a very weird thing when it comes to audience reactions because nine times out of 10, you don't see the, the reaction and you have to look for it through social media, you have to look for it online, you have to look for it through word of mouth, you have to look for it through repeat business. So there are, sometimes there are different um, uh, uh, key performance indicators that we look at to determine whether or not things are working. When blackout tends to work best, the reactions generally are pretty strong and undeniable, um, although not concrete in the sense that, you know, somebody screaming and running out of the theater is, you know, thumbs up. That said, we rarely hear from that person again. So just watching them run out of the theater kind of should be success enough to go it was effective and they needed to get the fuck out of here, which is, you know, an awesome, an awesome thing to have. Uh, you know, there's a lot of negative feedback that comes from Blackout, too. A lot of people don't always talk about the fact that there's a lot of negative feedback, actually maybe equally negative feedback as much as there is positive feedback. And I think for us as creators, it always keep, keeps us relatively humble in the sense that this is not for everybody. We're not trying to please everybody. And whether we want to or not, we're actually gonna piss a lot of people off in a very real way, not in a funny way, not in a like, ha we got you, in a, no, genuinely, actually, that was a bad experience for you, and that sucks, and I don't want that to happen. I admit that this is a, a specific experience that um, is not for everybody. I don't, 
want to hurt people. I don't want to. I, I don't want to make them angry per se. I still would like them to get through it and and have some sort of you know emotional response to it. So it's just it's always important to remember that you know especially in these interviews and these retrospectives, like we do not shy away from the fact that uh, blackout is a very polarizing experience, and you see a lot of positive reactions. You see a lot of negative reactions, and even then the positive reactions sometimes come off as super negative in the moment. People yelling, people freaking out and demanding money back or whatever, and it's not until two or three days later that they'll, you know, send an email and kind of go, you know, in retrospect, I realize you were trying to push my buttons, you were trying to get under my skin, and I was actually okay and safe, and you didn't hurt me, and holy shit, that was amazing. Uh, but in the moment, they were super pissed and were about to call the police, so reactions are hard, and I, I think within the, the creative world, you just, you keep going, and you hope that people keep buying the album. So when Midsummer Nightmare first started, it was the first time that we, uh, t to my knowledge, uh, actively started touching and interacting with participants in a way that most theater projects don't, very specifically the way that haunted houses don't. That said, it was a very, very light light experience. It really took several years before the, the aggressive physical touch within Blackout sort of started ramping up and, and developing into what it is now. Uh, and, and with that, it started very soft and gentle. No joke, several interactions within the first show involved feathers which is not like a hallmark of, of blackout. You know, you think of, of rubber and leather and, and things and metal, um, but it was mainly just like feathers rubbing against your skin. And, and that was actually revolutionary at the time. Uh, so it started off very light. And I distinctly remember sort of skipping forward a couple of years to Halloween 2010 uh, and then the off season 2011 where uh, the, the physical interactions began to escalate. And I distinctly remember the first time we tied someone's hands behind their back and Chris and I were literally standing right there watching the actor do it. And, and, and uh, I mean, on the, on the absolute like uh, seat of my chair, I was standing up, but like just like leaning forward, terrified that something was gonna happen, terrified that he was gonna fall. And so we watched it like a hawk to just determine how far you could push it. And that really was sort of the first domino knocking down. What I will say 100% is that uh, we tend to be looped into this category of sort of extreme torture porn. And when I look back at our uh, uh, retrospective when I look at what we're doing and, and what is coming up it is a very tame experience compared to several things that I have gone through over the past several years and I think what the extreme horror genre has turned into is not what blackout started and truly was never the track that blackout was on and when we talk about physical touch within the first blackout uh, and ramping up even then, there was a sense of security and escalation and necessity that went behind all of those decisions. Uh, and none of them, not a single one of them, had to do with bondage or S&M or, or pain or, or inflicting some sort of uh, a physical response um, in a way that a, a, a bondage lesson might. And so uh, that's been an interesting thing for me, just in the, the history of Blackout, that even as we come back after 10 years, it's, it's really about solidifying what we did well, what we do well, and what we will continue to do well, and what we continue to offer to this environment. And for me, it is significantly more psychological. It is significantly more about the um, anticipation and the threat of violence than it is actually the, the, the physical touch. So the summer 2010, Midsummer Nightmare, I think was really a turning point for Blackout. It was 
when we really latched on to what it was the show is about, which is about this, this sort of immersive, personalized horror experience. We took it outside of a theater and brought it into the real world. We put it into a hotel room. Rather than having people check in at a desk or whatever, we asked them to meet us at a phone booth on a corner. We videotaped their, them, them uh, uh, saying the waiver. They got a burner phone and had to walk down the street and then had all these instructions. I think it was the first time that we really actively embraced the idea that Blackout wasn't just this 20 minute haunted maze thing, that it was actually more of a, I don't know, just it was a, a, a place for people to come and step outside of the theater, to open the four walls of the performance space into location-based entertainment into the real world, embracing ARGs, embracing alternate reality, uh, LARPing and games, and it sort of all just weirdly coalesced into this super fucked up 45 minute experience that started on the street, moved into a hotel room, and then ended on the street, and ended up only requiring, I think, three or four actors in a hotel room, and, um, it really just sort of, I think, blew open what Blackout was and what people could expect from us. Uh, it was always uh, um, was a small invite-only event, as the majority of the off-seasons from that point forward became. And it turned uh, from 2010, I think what started happening was our Halloween season events became a little bit more mass market your sort of 20 to 25 minute walk through, you could experience some crazy stuff, but it's the off season events with the personal invitation that you needed to receive based on your fan status and how many shows you had gone through and how active you were. That was when it all started it, it, within that hotel room show. So, you know, I'm, I'm making this up, but I'm tempted to say we only had an audience of maybe like 30 or 40 people for the entire run of the show and that, again, started the, the off-season um, path of, of sort of Halloween shows accommodating several thousand, off-season invite-only shows accommodating, you know, 30 to 50 people while we were in one city. And then, of course, once we started opening in other cities, we would, you know, be able to do 30 to 50 people in New York, 30 to 50 people in L.A., and so on. The Blackout community started to form completely on its own, totally organically, and almost uh, uh, out of sight of Chris and I even recognizing that it was happening. It wasn't until, and honestly, I, I don't even remember what the experience was, but at a certain point, we were invited into their private Facebook page. And it was at that point that we understood that there were a group of 20 to 30-ish people that were within the, the New York City and, and surrounding areas that had, over the, the course of a couple of years, kind of naturally found each other and started sharing those blackout experiences together. They would attend the show together. Obviously, they'd go through individually, uh, but then they would all hang out afterwards and talk about their experience. And it wasn't until it was a little bit fully formed that we were even invited into that process. And just the fact that it was happening was such a huge compliment. Just, I mean, to this day, it, it, it astounds me. And I'm wearing a jacket, but I'm, I, I get chills. I, you know, the, the response that people had to this show was overwhelming, humbling, gratifying, touching, and frankly, sometimes scary. Uh, because it, it started at that point, and, and with each city that we went into, there, there were new people that would sort of come into this, and it turned into a bit of an international thing with people starting to fly in, and then the tattoos started, and, and then there was like wars between the different Facebook communities and New York versus LA, and then you had factions within each faction, and uh, it was amazing, and Again, it's just like a whole string of adjectives here. Amazing and humbling and scary and overwhelming. Um, but at the end of the day, 
what was very apparent was that something was happening and it was happening with or without our support. We actively tried to support it in its early days at one of the off seasons. Honestly, I don't remember which one. We actually invited every member of the off season two or three days when they had all finished to meet Chris and I at a bar at a certain night. Um, so all of us could sit in the same room together. And the idea very specifically was that Chris and I would start this group, we would answer a couple of questions, and then we would leave because we wanted them to bond with each other without the blackout um, narrative being put on top of them. Because it's so important that uh, we honor what their experience is. And that was such an important thing from the very beginning with the audiences, which is everybody's experience is different and you do have to honor that. You don't have to let them go through it. <laughs> you know, you can say we don't approve of that experience and you need to stop and I'm kicking you out right now. And that's when I say things get scary sometimes. There are stalker moments, there are psychological moments, there are psychotic break moments, there are um, uh, several things that we have encountered with our fans and with guests and with audience members that have absolutely crossed a line. And so for us, it's about trying to just navigate that, honor everybody's experience, and still honor what the true experience is. And for Chris and I to stay true to what it is we're trying to do. And that's incredibly important. I know of many other shows and many other creators right now that are looking to their audience to help shape and build what happens, and that scares me. Uh, I think Chris and I have always very strongly been able to, to be true to what it is that we do, and just try to you know, stay as safe as we can within those confines. In 2011, our off-season was an incredibly formative and important show. Um, there are several things that became slightly iconic from that experience that to this day I still see so many other people ripping off like so blatantly. Um, but there are uh, several things that again we tried to bring it into the real world and, and, and really marry the blackout aesthetic with a bit of an ARG kind of experience that shifted into a maze and then kind of ended back in the real world. And I think that ultimately those off-season experiences became a breeding ground for us to explore how Blackout started infiltrating people's lives. And the, the Halloween shows were awesome and everybody loved those and you get a t-shirt and it's super fun and suck on a tampon and, and that's great. Um, but the off-season shows are, are really where I think we were able to dig into genuinely getting into people's heads and, and, and creating an experience that lived above and beyond that 45 minutes that they were with us. And that is not only a very important part of where Blackout was headed in that sense that it's never over, it is always a part of you, that once you've gone through it, once you've said that oath that you are a part of Blackout and Blackout is a part of you, that every time those lights turn off, every time you hear a noise in the dark, like that, you know, that three dot logo should be the first thing you think of. And I think that genuinely that, um, that other worldly um, experience, not supernatural, just, just sort of starting to lay on top of the guests' lives uh, is where those off-season shows began to live. And that was a huge part of that van experience. And there are some really um, gross, nasty, uh, fun content things that came out of that show but also some really important, I think, logistical and practical things that we discovered um, while putting that show together in terms of creating suspense and creating anticipation and drawing things out and changing um, location and, and circumstance and situation and revelation of space and, and all of those things. So it, was a very, uh, it was a very important show for us. So a lot of people ask, where the um, inspiration for so many of our, our bigger moments come from. And it's such a valid question and such a great question. I'll just answer it by saying, 
necessity is the mother of all invention and nine times out of ten money and money issues and challenges is the mother of all invention and you uh, come up with great ideas just by looking around and seeing what you have available to you and that is almost always been the way that Chris and I have worked as artists is is looking around seeing what's there and kind of creating from that moment as opposed to sitting in a blank room creating you know this huge thing and then looking around seeing what we can do and scaling our thing down we would sort of work the opposite way um, and, and everybody works differently and um, you know I'm, I'm, I'm a huge proponent that um, Nobody should listen to what I say. That's just the way that, that Chris and I work, and I think everybody does their own thing. But for Chris and I, we tend to walk into a space, look around, and say, what do we have, and what can we do with it? And, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if this is a disappointment, but in the, the case of the ice cream truck in 2011, you're building a show in a warehouse on 11th Avenue, and all of a sudden this ice cream truck shows up on the street. What are you supposed to do except for throw it into the show? So we did. Two thousand and twelve was a really big year again for Blackout because uh, that was the year we went to Trans World, which again I think was a really formative moment within Blackout's history because we had never ever considered ourselves to be a haunted house in any way, shape, or form. We were a the theater experience. We are a theater experience. To this day, I will go to my grave and say this is an immersive theater experience. But it shares many. Uh, traits of, of a haunted house and, and I completely understand that and while we started we never Anticipated that we were a haunted house or that we would upend the haunted house industry in any way shape or form and it wasn't really until Running for a couple of years and hearing all these other haunted houses starting to uh, adapt and adopt our uh, Methodology and and starting to rail against us that I sort of turned around and went. Oh my god do people consider us actually a haunted house? Like, could we be a haunted house? Is this an, an interesting business angle for us to take? One of the largest uh, conventions at that time for haunted houses was Transworld. Happens uh, annually in St. Louis. And it was just a, a huge, huge convention and meeting spot for the entire industry all around the world. And especially in that time, it was, it was just a very important place to be. And like I said, we never considered ourselves to be part of that world. And I thought it would be a really awesome and just bold act to sort of drop into a place like Trans World and in a very American way, just fucking stick a flag in the moon and be like, fuck it, it's ours. And like, we're the new haunted house. And that's pretty much exactly what we did. And I was not expecting it to have the reaction that it did. I went out there by myself. I hired an actress. We rehearsed in my hotel room, which was so scary and awkward. And um, uh, I offered to do it in the lobby if she was uncomfortable. But uh, it was a very interesting, again, formative time. We were just coming up with ideas on the spot. And, and I wanted to go against the grain. So we created a white background, knowing that it was trans world and everything was black and blood and dragons and, and, and you know knives and guts. So we were like, let's just be clean and simple and succinct. And I had a giant white background that just said blackout on it. There was a TV that showed this awful surgery video that we use all the time. There was a woman who performed an eight hour performance over the course of the day and she never interacted with guests. There was a, a rope there so that guests were not able to step into the booth and it just had this amazing effect on the convention. People didn't know what to make of it. This was a sales convention where people came to make contacts and sell their, their wares and, and, and put business cards out and here we were doing nothing more than a publicity stunt. And literally it just, it blew people's minds, not even in a good way. Like it was, it was controversial, people got upset, people were yelling at the woman, yelling like, what are you selling? I never, as the creator, introduced myself. I never was a part of the booth. I just sort of sat back and watched the whole thing happen. And there were consistently just throngs of people 
mesmerized by what the fuck this blackout thing was. The other really interesting thing was that even during setup, uh, before the convention opened, no joke, the moment I dropped the back, uh, the backdrop, immediately someone walked up and said, blackout? Are you serious? I thought this was a myth. I didn't think you guys actually existed. And I sort of went, what? Like, what What do you mean? <laughs> My name's Josh, what's your name? And, and I started learning very quickly that within the haunted house community, Blackout was a, a, a thing. Blackout had developed a name. And within two or three years, almost every single ha haunted house in the country would have either ad adopted our practices or strongly come out against us. Two thousand and twelve was also the year that we expanded. Uh, for us, Blackout always had a huge um, sense of exposure. Blackout always had a lot of press. Uh, we were very fortunate. We were very lucky with a lot of the the press coverage that we had, having really wonderful stories in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and IndieWire and BBC and being featured on Carson Daly and Ryan Seacrest. And I think just because of that, we were able to elevate our status within a certain celebrity community. And so, you know, we were in the middle of Manhattan. Naturally, uh, celebrities started coming and people started showing up and it just kind of started taking on that whole world. By default, we started working with bigger producers and uh, with those bigger producers came opportunities to expand uh, with new producing models, new production models, uh, new venues, new opportunities, new partners, new sponsors. And so we were able to start uh, looking into that expansion model significantly uh, uh, more than we had ever in the past just because we we started having more exposure and more producers uh, uh, express interest and in doing so we found opportunities within the Los Angeles market that were very uh, uh, amazing and real and so we decided to act on it and so consequently we opened up uh, in Los Angeles in 2012 and ran in 2012 in, in New York as well. That was the first time that we sort of went by coastal and, and began that blackout expansion model. I think we saw very quickly that there was an audience for it basically no matter where we went. The question just was, could you find a financial model for the show that actually worked? The LA market was incredibly positive and fantastic it just I feel like we kind of dropped a rock into this pond and and there were just the ripple effects of it were huge there was a fan base that developed so fast and so quickly um, the opportunities in LA you know to to Hollywood to to recording companies to different artists are so much more I think there are just more opportunities out here for those connections to be made because those agencies are out here so very quickly, uh, you know, we experienced a lot of really positive feedback to the show. We experienced a lot of new opportunities between sponsorship and, and producing opportunities and uh, starting to get hired for other things as well. And that was ultimately when we started to see the sort of the, the seeds that we had planted in 2009 for Blackout start to actually go into the real world in terms of different jobs, different production companies hiring us to do that version of our artistic output for them and, and putting our slant on it. It was an amazingly incredible and prolific time for Chris and I. We uh, started working with Jason Blum and Blumhouse, which was so in incredible and wonderful and we, he gave us so many great opportunities to work on his IP like The Purge and Insidious. Uh, we created uh, other partnerships and opportunities through Universal Pictures and, and Focus Features and I think that was an opportunity that Chris and I saw on a very personal level uh, where Blackout had an effect within the LA community and we automatically started seeing rewards just on a personal level in a way that we hadn't seen before. Blackout is a very tough show to be financially successful. It does not make for a very good business model and 
There's just no way around it. And no matter how you slice it, whether it be the 2014 group show, whether it be running you know, two shows in different cities at the same time, it is a very dif difficult business model. So that LA expansion, I think, allowed the blackout content and the blackout aesthetic to actually start expanding into different artistic projects. Elements 2013, amazingly uh, 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 awesome and crazy show where we really tried to break the mold, do some, some crazy new shit. It was a popular show. It was a really hated show as well. Honestly, I think more people during the time hated it than liked it. In retrospect, I think more people like it than didn't like it, but at the time it certainly didn't feel that way. Uh, but Elements was a really important show for us because we really tried to double down on, on uh, a lot of the creative decisions that we had made and tried to push it uh, farther than we had in the past. And I love that show. I love what came out of it. I think the audience's experience was great. I think we played with different aesthetics and different um, uh, concepts that no one else had really done before and you still see people wrestling with right now and actively I, I still think that you know we took one hell of a crack at trying to, to give the audience agency and give them choice and and that was really the importance of, of 2013's elements what was interesting was um, you know everybody feels within elements that you know it was such a personal choice but I think what made it so effective was you always were given just one of two choices it was either a or B and they were very valid choices and by default you uh, uh, went down a, a prescribed path, but it truly was like the same pathway as Bandersnatch or, or Black Mirror or, or anything like that, where you're not creating choices. You don't actually have agency to change the narrative. There, there is a, a certain path that the audience goes down, but they have the opportunity to decide which way. It's, it is very much a choose your own adventure kind of story. And so, you know, the, the choices to the audience were always very simple at, at the time. It was either A or B, up or down, left or right, green or red. But the consequence to those choices, what A and B stood for, what left and right stood for, were huge in terms of your implication uh, and the story that you were creating. That said, from a, a, a formulaic point of view, it was a very clear-cut choose-your-own-adventure story. We really doubled down on what Blackout was about and I think what people were reacting to, which was you had your own experience in the show. And so we wanted you to feel really connected to the space. We wanted you to feel really, really connected to the characters. And so every one of those choices, whether it be uh, like an experiential choice of do you want to be sort of wet or do you want to be sopping wet? Uh, whether it be an emotional choice of do you want to be the victim or do you want to be the aggressor? All of those just had very uh, high stakes. All of those, those decisions had very high stakes and all of them involved really like tying the audience member to the show and to the actors and to the space. So again, like are you going to get like wet or are you just gonna like sort of get wet these were things that were very very palpable right like your shoes getting wet versus your entire body getting wet is something that you are not going to be able to deny you might hate it you might love it uh, but it is undeniable with blackout elements we wanted to create something where the audience was was really uniquely connected to the show and for us, that's a character connection, but it's also an atmosphere environment connection. So every single one of those choices were extreme choices. You were getting completely wet. You were 
actively forming a bond with a character. And so in a very blackout way, it seemed like the right thing to do that once you were asked to form that bond, there would be some sort of consequence to that bond. And so in, in our case within that show, it sort of ended the way that it did with the gun and what are you gonna do to her and sort of ending up in the, the coffin with that character. Um, but it, it really all stems from trying to form a bond with the audience member and the show itself. And in that moment, with Elements specifically, we tried to do that with the environment and what happened to you, what the environment did to you, whether that be water, heat, or, or any other physical element, or from a narrative element, what that bond with that female character did to you and how you needed to, you know, deal with that at the end. Two thousand fourteen was the first year that we decided to put people through in groups. It clearly had mixed results. Uh, I think both creatively and, uh, um, you know, within the the scope of, of Blackout. I'm, I'm super happy we tried it. I think it's a world that we wanted to explore. I, you know, for Chris and I, we don't care so much about what's uh, what other people are doing. I think we're very conscious and cognizant of, of what is happening in the, the scene and what other groups are doing, what other groups are, are trying to explore. And, you know, certainly in 2013 and 14 is, is absolutely when the immersive horror scene, very specifically in LA, started growing and, and very actively started asking the same questions that we had been asking for several years. And so I think by default, we just said, well, if you guys are doing that, we'll sort of start asking ourselves some other questions. Um, with that said, the moment we sent somebody through alone, there was always that question, could you do this as a group? Is there an opportunity to put two people through, a couple through, or three, four, five, six, seven, eight? Could there be a traditional haunt version of Blackout? So House was never a, a reaction to what other people were doing. I think it, it was our fifth year. We needed a, a gimmick for that year. It, it seemed like the right thing to do uh, because we had tried so many other things. So we wanted to sink our teeth into that group experience. And truly the thing that we said then and the thing that I'll say now is the question for Blackout from the beginning was always, what will you as an audience member do? How will you react in this situation? When you put other audience members in that same group with you, the question then becomes, how do you react when you know other people are watching you? Which is a totally different ball game. And almost more importantly, within the blackout sense, what will you potentially do to other people? Or what will you allow them to do to you? Again, those, those are the questions that we walked into to that room with. And, you know, it's, it, it was a controversial show. I, I think even, Several years, five years later, I can look back and say, you know, there are things that we did right in that show. There are things that we did wrong in that show. I'm very glad for the experience. I'm happy with everything that came out of it. Um, and it definitely seems like the natural progression of what we were working on. Uh, and with that, I think we also defined at the end of that experience that blackout, the true blackout experience is a singular experience. Um, and that is really what it comes down to. And, and even several years later, we continued to play with groups and sending people through at the Armory with Helen the Armory. So it's not like we ever abandoned sending people through in groups. And, um, you know, whether people want to, un, you know, admit this or not, you're not always going through Blackout 100% alone. I mean, sometimes you're not always alone. And so it's not anything we've abandoned, but I think the initial show up with eight friends, go through together and end together uh, was probably a very singular experience that, that lived in 2014's house alone.
So for Chris and I, we always are trying to change the game, even for ourselves. I don't really say that in a pretentious way. I mean, yes, it is a pretentious, artistic, creative thing that we are always trying to, to think of new ways, to new things to do, but it's also just a very clear-cut, practical thing. We don't want to continue doing the same thing. You know, renting out another warehouse and, and going for it again is awesome, but we did that for several years. So with the off seasons, as, as I've been saying this whole time, I think we were always trying to escalate how connected the audience could become to the actual experience. And taking them out of a theater, putting them on a street, putting them in a car, putting them in a, a warehouse, putting them in a hotel room, all of those things were methods that we had to get into the audience member's life. It just seemed so obvious that, well, where else could we go except literally into your house? And so that's the decision we made. We had a very specific fan base at that time. It, wasn't the kind of show that we did casually. We knew exactly where, well, we didn't know where we were going, but we knew whose house we were going into. Um, we took a lot of precautions on our end from, from a safety perspective uh, in, in numerous ways. I mean, walking into somebody's house, just sort of you open yourself to intense amounts of just liability that you have no idea what they set up or, or what they're doing and, and you know I as a blackout creator know more than a lot of other people in this field there are some really fucked up fans out there who have very strong personal attachments to this 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 work and you don't know what you're getting into so it was a very scary experience for us but it was also one of the best blackout experiences because ultimately everything that we had been working on again just sort of congeals into this three or four day period where a group of people get into one space and we're all single minded and, and, and focused on what it is we're trying to do and how we're trying to affect that audience member and with just a laser like focus we just hammer it out and try to knock it out in a couple of days do as many people as we can um, and I'm very proud of that experience it was an intense experience I think it pushed a lot of boundaries. I think it pushed our boundaries uh, as creators. Um, there was certain content that I would never, ever, ever repeat again. Um, I'm happy we did it. I'm happy we tried it. I'm happy nobody got hurt. Um, and it was a very intense show. I think it truly did what it was we wanted to do. We really got into people's heads. We genuinely got into their lives in a way that uh, we never had before. As the years went on, we just started opening ourselves to a lot more opportunities to collaborate, to work with different producers, to work on different content. Um, we worked for, for several shows with Skrillex uh, and his whole management team, which was awesome creating uh, personal shows for his birthday and, and for some of his team's birthdays and different parties. Uh, we were hired by Queens of the Stone Age to do, to do um, some, some concerts for them, which again, were just, so cool to work with other people. I mentioned earlier working with Jason Blum, working with uh, certain great uh, folks from Universal and, and being able to work on different IP outside of the blackout world, but still within the blackout aesthetic, was just so rewarding. After working on blackout for so long, it was just fun to, to take everything that we had learned and, and apply it to different audiences, different IP, different producers, different venues. And, and with that, in 2015 and 2016, we were approached by kink.com, uh, who were uh, at the time in the San Francisco Armory, um, which is an amazing venue in an amazing city. We had wanted to go to San Francisco for many years. This just seemed like a perfect opportunity to work in a venue that was just so well suited to our aesthetic. And obviously to work for a company that is, you know, it's an adult film company. So, so you know, from a, a 18 and over point of view, allowing us to sort of embrace that content and push it even farther was just so appealing. All of those things just kind of lined up and we said, awesome, let's do it. 
We signed the contract and uh, for 2015, for 2016, we lived in, inside the, the armory while we were working there and building the show. And 2015, 2016 were two vastly different shows. 2015 was more of a, a, a massive uh, walk through, through the entire space that was an incredibly long period of time and, 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 and it incorporated many of the, the different film sets in the basement that Kink uses on a daily basis. It was an incredible integration into their production studios and just a huge, huge, um, huge overblown, awesome opportunity that to this day, I just have such a soft spot in my heart for that sh show. There was like a weird sense of joy with the Inferno show that, that came from 2015 that even the music, uh, we used brighter lights, we used different colors, we used um, more uh, different music tracks that were not as dark. It still had that blackout aesthetic, but in a weird way, it was almost more of a celebratory blackout vibe, which I loved. Um, so that was our 2015 show, our 2016 show was significantly smaller, was, uh, uh, was resigned to a couple of tiny bedrooms in the back of, uh, of the second floor, and almost had more of an escape room vibe to it, a, a little bit more of a group-oriented kind of uh, experience. So those were two vastly different experiences that we got the pleasure of working on in that amazing, amazing, haunted, scary castle in the middle of, of San Francisco. One of the things that I think people don't get about Blackout is they sort of forget or maybe they didn't read enough, but you know, Blackout is not, a, it's not always a great time for people. And most importantly, even though you go through alone, it is our experience and, and that is very much the point of Blackout. You go through the way we want you to go through. We see what we want you to see. You can feel whatever it is you want to feel, but it is our show. You do not get to dictate in any way, shape, or form how fast you go, how slow you go, what you look at, what you don't look at. That's why we have a safety word. Um, that's why uh, people are constantly being pulled out of the show for not following instructions. There tends to be this sort of uh, a completely wrong methodology within haunted houses where it's like, oh, I don't like this scene, I'm just gonna skip forward to the next, to the next scene. You don't get to do that in Blackout. And and so with that, you don't get to dictate what your experience is going to be. And so we have many, many people that just sort of forget about that and decide to show up in full-blown costume or they decide to show up with a, you know, a kind of haunted house character that they're the tough guy and, and, and whatever. It comes in many different forms with Blackout. Uh, but specifically people in costume, their costumes are gonna get ruined. Uh, and it's funny, we don't entirely go out of our way to ruin people's costumes. It just naturally will happen over the course of the evening. Um, and and uh, yeah, so we are known for um, wrecking people's costumes. And I don't mind that. I'm totally okay with that. Maybe I'm happy with it. Blackout 21 was uh, a really interesting and new experience that we tried. Um, as I've been saying, every step of this process has been about trying to integrate blackout into people's lives. It seems that that was what was happening, and so that's what we always tried to push farther into. Um, uh, this idea that our tagline for many years is it's never over and that's because once you leave the show people continue to sort of have those those remaining effects and the idea that once those lights turn off and you hear a sound that the the three dots are the first thing you think about that's awesome I think that's that's where blackout lives and I just on a personal level am terrified of everything I am an awfully frightened person. I'm afraid of heights. I'm afraid of vampires. I'm afraid of monsters. I'm afraid of home invasions. I'm just, you name it, I'm afraid of it. And I scare myself a lot. And one of the things that Blackout has been able to do very well, I think, or so I hear from people, is been able to give people canvas that they project their own fears and, and, and consequently they scare themselves. So the question has always been, how do you create an experience for people to scare themselves in a way that I will never be able to scare you 
as much as your own mind can scare itself. So, as I said, I'm terrified of everything. I was visiting my parents at the end of 2015. They live in a house that uh, the complete back of the house is all windows and it uh, looks over the scary pond and there are woods behind the pond and you cannot see anything. And it must have been two o'clock in the morning one day and I was uh, uh, by myself and I was sitting in the living room and I was just staring out the windows fucking freaking out that somebody was out there looking in and this is just this is what i do i scare myself and i literally at that exact moment thought how can i create an experience to replicate this exact moment how can i create something where at two o'clock in the morning somebody is standing at their front door or standing at their kitchen table and looking out and going holy shit, is blackout out there looking at me right now? And the bottom line is, I never knew if somebody was out there staring at me, but it didn't matter. Just the threat that somebody was out there scared me enough, and I wanted to do that to other people. And that's how Blackout was, uh, 21 was born. So ultimately, 21 was an amazing experience, and it started being played by several people all around the country. Um, that said, uh, with what was happening to Blackout internally, situationally, from the other experiences that we were working on, some of the other projects that started taking precedence, a couple of other companies that also started pushing really heavily into that exact model, uh, it just became time to let 21 to sort of settle down and, and take all of those things and use them in different ways. But the actual 21 experience, completing all 21 chapters, is, is something that will, you know, most likely continue for a very long period of time, but at the moment has, has sort of gone dormant based on some of the other things that we're working on. In 2016, we put the show in an RV. Uh, it was a great choice, same way that we did with the hotel, same, same way that we did with going into people's houses. It literally always starts with the exact same question. What have we done that we haven't done before? And what's going to, going to be incredibly effective? And also, what can we do? What do I have at my disposal? Living in LA, I had RV rentals at my disposal. Um, I used to run around the S Silver Lake Reservoir and I used to see all these RVs parked around and just the idea hit me at one point that like wouldn't it be fucking terrifying if there was just, if somebody lived, if there was just an experience that happened quietly in this thing as everybody's walking their dog and running around and um, you know that's, that's basically where the show came from. And, and truly, there is nothing novel about the RV show in and of itself, other uh, uh, above and beyond what the hotel did or what the the going into people's house houses did. It is truly all born out of the exact same idea, which is just trying to integrate ourselves into people's lives in a way that they're not expecting. Asking somebody to meet uh, in a phone booth giving them an envelope with a hotel room key and then a phone and letting them leave to go to a hotel room, they're not expecting that. Um, getting three knocks on their door and having us walk into their house, they're not expecting that. Being told to meet at a car on a corner and then being told to go walk half a block and knock on an RV door, you know, again, it is just, it is completely disrupting the sense of ordinary and completely taking that person out of what it, what it is that they're thinking is going to happen, it is in that vulnerable moment that Blackout's able to kind of hit you. Blackout doesn't have an effect if, if the lead up and the anticipation to the payoff isn't there. And as most everybody knows, Blackout is about the lead up, it's about the anticipation. And, and the payoff nine times out of 10 comes, comes into your own head afterwards and so, you know, for us, we just try to constantly knock those blocks out from under you to, to keep your heart rate going fast and, and truthfully to keep your body in front of your mind. The moment that your mind goes, oh, I know what's happened. Oh, I see what they're, we've lost. The only, the only tool I have within Blackout is to keep your physical sensation 
the priority and to keep your mind in the distance. So as with everything, uh, just every year that we come back, we are constantly asking ourselves what's new, what new collaborations, what new productions, what new venues, what new concepts, what new everything can we do. Chris and I are both good friends with Michael and Landon who, who run the Overlook Film Festival. Uh, they approached us about what it was they were trying to do with the festival, the audience that they wanted, how they wanted to activate the off movie times and what they were trying to do. Uh, we just had a, a kinship with those guys. Uh, we liked what they were trying to do. We really liked the festival. We loved the opportunity for Blackout. I think ultimately that's really what it came down to is, is we liked on a personal level the, the conversations we were having with them. So we felt you know, that we were all on the same page. And then on a professional level, we liked the opportunity they were able to provide. Same way that um, Kink was able to provide the castle, same way that Jason Blum was able to provide the, the, the places he was able to provide. It's just, you know, with each new collaboration, everybody looks at, at, at what is the mutually beneficial relationship that we can all give each other. And, and uh, you know, Overlook at that time needed the, the tent pole of Blackout as a horror experience. It was one of the, the hallmarks of the immersive horror world. So them being able to have Blackout within the festival was, was an awesome thing for them. Us being able to have an opportunity to be a part of this new horror film festival was fucking great for us. Um, we were all friends, so we enjoyed spending time together. It was a venue, and, and that really was, was the, the genesis of, of how it all started. Ultimately, what it turned into was a great opportunity for us to create a new show, to activate a new audience, bring new people into the fold, and just kind of come up with new ways of telling our story to a different crowd. And like, we had never done a film festival before, we had never really done that festival convention world. Everything that we had done in, in that world had been within a different venue and just a totally different sense. So being in the middle of a festival for 10 hours every day so people could go see movies, then come do us, then go do other immersive things was just a super co cool world that we wanted to be a part of. And I'm, I'm really glad that we were able to be there for two years. It's pretty simple why we're coming back uh, in 2019. It's our 10 year anniversary. It's as, it's as simple as that. I mean, it's, it's a big moment for us. It's a big moment for, I think, any theater show, any theatrical production to stick around for 10 years. Um, and that is just, that's not a feat that a lot of theater artists get the opportunity to do or just have the opportunity to work on something for 10 years. So as a, a completely celebratory, masturbatory, just selfish, pat yourself on the back and celebrate the 10 years of, of the work that we've done. That's absolutely why we're coming back. Uh, we have an amazing fan base. We have an amazing reputation right now. And, you know, the idea is to try to harness all of that, to utilize all of that. and. You know, like we've always done, just genuinely try to create the most effective and unforgettable experience that we can to give people what it is that they want from Blackout. Um, I think for many, many years we've constantly been trying to innovate and do something new and come up with new ideas, but now that we have 10 years of content and different versions and different things under our belt, I don't think there's that much more new that we can do, frankly. I, I, I don't think we're trying to innovate right now as much as we are just trying to synthesize every single thing that we've learned and really create an experience that just gives you what you fucking want from the blackout experience. And, you know, it has always been a polarizing experience. We've never been able to effectively uh, 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 hit successfully every single person. It's always a 50-50 thing. For every person that comes out loving it, there's always gonna be somebody who comes out hating it. You know, for the, for the person who is terrified and calls the safety word in the first three seconds, there's always gonna be the person who comes out and says, I wanted you to do more and hit me harder and do this and do that. Um, so for us, it isn't about trying to uh, um, 
satisfy people as much as it is trying to recognize what we've learned over 10 years, what we think we've been most successful at, and create an experience that is able to synthesize all of that into one fucking awesome 25 minute walkthrough that just gives you what you want, shocks you, surprises you. Hopefully he gets you coming back for more.